Well, everyone, I don't know how to start this video. I usually have something already made up in order to have a uh, sort of a soft opening for you. But with this case, we're going back to Texas. Yep, definitely. And I don't know what's going on in Texas, uh, but it must be something in the water because we have another wrongful conviction. Michael Morton was wrongfully convicted of the murder of his wife, Christine. So with that being said, I'm only going to tease you with that. Let's get into it. So when Michael Morton met his soon-to-be wife in college, his roommate was actually trying to use a really sorry pickup line on her, and of course, to his advantage, she did not fall for it. He then said to himself, I definitely have to meet this girl, and so he did. Fast forward, Michael and Christine actually got married. Michael was a supermarket manager in Texas, as well as he was married to Christine, and eventually they had a son named Eric. He considered himself an average kind of guy with an average kind of life. He had the girl of his dreams, a child, a house with a yard. He had everything but the white picket fence. Lucky, he said, but average. So who would have known within just a few short years, Michael Morton's life would be turned upside down. It was August 12th of 1986, and it just so happened to be Michael's birthday. So it was decided that just the three of them would go out to dinner and have a nice quiet celebration. Yep. When they got home, they put their little boy to bed and then Michael was expecting a uh, dessert from his wife. But by the time he came out of the bathroom from brushing his teeth, she had fallen asleep. She woke up a little later that night and told him she was sorry that she had fallen asleep. And she promised him that she would make it up to him tomorrow. So he said, okay. 5 a.m. the next morning rolled around and Michael got ready for work kissed his wife goodbye, and left for work as usual. But before he ran out the door, he left a note on the bathroom mirror expressing disappointment that he and his wife could not be intimate that night before, but ended the note with the words, I love you, and then he left around 5.30 a.m. And that was the last morning he would ever see his wife alive ever again. This was in Round Rock, Texas. Population at that time was around only 20,000 people. 31-year-old Christine Morton would be found dead in her master bedroom after being bludgeoned to death that very morning. Later on that afternoon, a neighbor found little Eric outside crying for help and eventually would find Christine Morton cold, bloodied, and dead at the scene. Sheriff Batwell of the Williamson County Sheriff's Department told Michael that Chris was dead. 
He asked to see her, but the sheriff refused. All they knew at the time is that she died from a fatal head injury. Michael cooperated with the sheriff's department in every which way he could. He told the truth and said he didn't do this. He got up as usual that morning and went to work. No changes in his schedule whatsoever. It was just like every other day. He did everything the sheriff's department asked of him, but by the next morning, the sheriff's department showed up at Michael's door with a warrant for his arrest for the murder of his wife, Christine Morton. Sheriff Batwell had been honing in on him the entire time. District Attorney Anderson ran the case from the very beginning. Michael broke down in tears on the witness stand when they showed him photos of his wife's dead body. The state's theory was that it was Michael's birthday. Christine had refused to have sex with him that night. And then he killed her out of a fit of rage. That was the state's case. <laughs> Wait, what? This is the state's case. I cannot believe this. A wife who falls asleep after dinner wakes up and tells her husband that she will make it up to him tomorrow. And then suddenly in a fit of rage, Michael decides to go ahead and beat the snot out of her and kill her with his little boy sleeping in the very next room. Yeah, uh, if I was on the jury, I would have said, is that all you got? Because I don't believe a damn word that's coming out of your mouth. Nope. Anyway... Michael's attorney claimed that Christine was murdered by a, psych a psychotic maniac that broke into the house after Michael had left for work. His defense could not say who did it, but Michael knew and his defense knew that he was an innocent man. The medical examiner had also testified that C Christine's time of death was way earlier than the time Michael had left for work. Okay, uh-huh. I see how this is going. So the authorities are trying to pin the murder on her husband, and then the medical examiner just magically comes up with a time that's earlier than Michael's own timeline when he left for work at 5.30 a.m. This is unbelievable. Do these cops actually do any real cop work? There were no witnesses, no physical or forensic evidence whatsoever that tied Michael Morton to the crime. I just don't know how the grand jury ever decided that they were going to take this case to trial. I just don't get it. A year later, after the trial was over and on August 17, 1987, Michael Morton was sentenced by a jury of his peers to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Needless to say, Michael was stunned. He was reeling in so many different directions and could not understand how he could be convicted of the crime of murder of his beautiful wife. It felt to him as if everything was so unreal, like a bad dream that he could not awake from. In 1987, Michael was then sent to prison in Huntsville, Texas. He was stripped of his identity, given a number, a white jumpsuit, and left to spend the rest of his natural life on the third tier of a tiny small prison cell for the rest of his life. His little boy Eric, Michael's son, not only lost his mother forever that day, but his father as well. But Michael was granted a court-ordered visitation with his son Eric every six months, he was brought to prison by his then sister-in-law uh, twice a year so he could visit with his little boy who, as he started to get older, began to look more and more like his mother. With each and every visit, the years that followed, Eric started to grow more and more distant from Michael. He had a new life, new friends, and was becoming more and more of a stranger each and every time he saw him. It was almost as if Michael knew he was slipping away. And one day Eric wrote him a letter 
and asked to suspend the visits. He did not know Michael as his father anymore. And that part of Eric's life was over. Michael was crushed, heartbroken. He knew at that very moment he would never see his son ever again. And to add insult to injury, Eric wanted to be adopted by his new family. Michael's sister-in-law and her husband were to be his new mother and father. And this affected Michael where there are no words that can describe the absolute gut punch. He was broken and bankrupt. And now the last shreds of his beautiful life he was barely hanging on to was over. In 2002, Michael's attorney, Bill Allison, who had been working pro bono for Michael for many, many years, had contacted the Innocence Project and asked them to take a look at Michael's case. He felt that having a fresh set of eyes would help him uh, much more than he could do at that time. So with that, the Innocence Project reviewed and decided to take on Michael's case with the help of the attorney, John Rayleigh. Amazing, amazing man. Yep. At this point, Michael had been transferred to the Michael unit in Tennessee Colony, Texas in 2003. This prison was not your average country club. The prisoners had to do hard labor out in the fields each and every day. In the hot, humid sun of Texas, in a prison with zero air conditioning and where most of the prisoners could not afford the luxuries of the basic necessities such as deodorant or sometimes even toothpaste. Michael described the smell of the prison as a cross between livestock, sweat, and desperation. I have no idea how he survived locked up behind bars. His entire family was gone and all he had to hang on to was God, his parents, and a group of lawyers who believed in his innocence. And that was all that would keep him going for years to come. In February 2005, Michael's attorney filed their first motion. They sought DNA testing on the swabs from Christine's body, as well as specifically for a bloody bandana that was found a hundred yards behind Michael's home, which they always felt was the escape route for the murderer. John Rayleigh called up the DA, who at that time was John Bradley. He introduced himself and asked for the DNA testing. District Attorney Bradley told John Rayleigh, and I quote, Why do you want to do that? Testing the DNA would only muddy the waters. Well, Rayleigh responded with, Well, Mr. Bradley, truth clarifies. We are only seeking the truth. Why oppose it? Incredible that a man like District Attorney John Bradley, who has sworn an oath, would continue to stall the appeal at every single turn. What in the bloody hell are they hiding? All right, so fast forward to March 7th, 2008. There was a hearing with Judge Stubblefield where John Rayleigh argued for the approval for the DNA testing of the bloodied bandana. In the meantime, the Innocence Project filed a Freedom of Information Act request for the sheriff's file. What was found in that file was absolutely astonishing. There was a police report made by the chief investigator at that time named Don Wood. It was taken 11 days after Chris Morton was murdered. The report was given by Rita Kirkpatrick, which was Christine Morton's mother, and her grandson, Eric, 
which, as you may recall, is Michael and Christine's son. It is a tape transcript of the conversation he had with Rita on August the 24th, 1986. This is a story that Rita tells to Don Wood about what Eric saw the morning of his mother's death. It is described in eerie detail. This is the conversation that she had with her grandson 11 days after her murder. Eric says, the monster is here. What's he doing? He hit mommy. Mommy is crying. Is she still crying? No, mommy stopped. The monster is mad, Eric said. The monster threw a blue suitcase on the bed. The monster is very mad. Rita then asked, well, where's daddy? Was daddy there? Eric said, no. Mommy and Eric were there. Eric also described the monster as having red hands. This report was in the case file since 1986. It was submitted, like I said, 11 days after Christine was murdered. In freaking credible. They were sitting on this evidence that would have blown a hole through this case and blown it wide open. This would have determined that someone other than Michael Morton was a suspect. They had the information the entire time. It was never followed up on. There were no deputies or investigators sent to Rita Kirkpatrick's home. No one came to interview Eric either. Insane, right? Absolutely incredible. All right, everyone, I'm breaking in here because there is some more information I forgot to give when I was actually doing the video. When Eric was talking to his grandmother, Kirkpatrick, this is Christine's mother, he also said and mentioned that the murderer or the monster had a very big mustache. He was a big monster and he had a very big mustache. And Investigator Wood's response to this was, and I quote, Wood sought instead to convince Rita of a bizarre theory that a big monster with a big mustache, as she referred to as the killer, a reference presumably to a description that Eric had given her had actually been Michael wearing his scuba diving gear yeah can you believe it the investigator said that it was michael actually wearing his scuba diving gear i don't know how you get a big monster with a mustache out of a scuba diving gear i just don't get it uh anyway i just wanted to mention that i thought it was important all right so back to the video Eventually, the defense won the right to test the DNA. Christine's blood was found on the bloodied bandana. And Michael's DNA was never found during the testing anywhere on the bandana. But an entirely different male DNA was mixed in with Christine's. The unknown DNA was then submitted into the Texas State Crime Lab into the program CODIS, which is a DNA databank system. And sure as shit, they got a hit on a man named Mark Allen Norwood, who was a career criminal. Breaking and entering, assault, assault with a deadly weapon, and attempted murder. This jack wagon had felonies in three different states. This man's DNA that was found on the bandana almost 25 years to the day of Christine's death. Incredible. Absolutely. What if this had been a capital murder case? This was 25 years later and more than likely Michael Morton would have been put to death and no one would have ever really known who 
killed Christine Morton. Eventually, Michael was acquitted of all charges and was immediately set free on December 19th, 2011. He served 24 years for a crime he did not commit. After Michael's exoneration, the Innocence Project filed a brief on Mr. Morton's behalf, and the Texas Supreme Court ordered an unprecedented court of inquiry to determine whether Ken Anderson, the former prosecutor who went on to become a judge, had committed any misconduct. Judge Ken Anderson swore in a deposition that he did not remember the facts of this case. He could not recall the most important facts of anything to do with Michael Morton. And he swore that what he was given were just the facts at that time. But at the same time, he began to repeat that he could not remember anything of, of the case to do with the state versus Michael Morton. So either you don't remember or you remember that the, the facts you were given were the right facts and that's all you had to work with or you're not remembering anything. So, you know, to me, the guy is just trying to cover up for himself because he doesn't realize that now his ass is on the hot seat and uh, he's going down and he's going down and taking a few people with him. Yep, that's for sure. You know, like I said before, these investigators did not want to do any real cop work whatsoever. They wanted to close this case as fast as possible and to appear on TV immediately afterwards and uh, say, yep, we've got our man. So it didn't matter to them if the man they were sending to prison or possibly getting the death penalty was the man who was responsible for Christine's murder. They just didn't give a shit. All they cared was, yep, we have a body. He's the one who did it and he's going down for Christine's murder. Now that Michael Morton has been free for a number of years, he now devotes his time campaigning for legal reforms in the hopes of helping other men of wrongful convictions. He's just, he reminds me of Daniel Villegas. He really does. In May of 2013, the Texas legislature unanimously passed the Michael Morton Act, establishing an open file policy that compels prosecutors to share evidence with his or her defense teams. Mark Allen Norwood was convicted of capital murder in the death of Christine Morton in March of 2013. He was given a death sentence, but the death penalty was waived at the request of Christine's family. So he was eventually sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Texas Supreme Court convened a rare court of inquiry in February 2013 to determine if former prosecutor Ken Anderson suppressed evidence in the Michael Morton case. The court ruled that there was probable cause to believe Mr. Anderson had violated criminal laws by concealing evidence and they ended up charging him with criminal contempt and tampering with evidence. The Texas State Bar also convicted him of concealing the exculpatory information from the trial judge and the Morton's defense team. The State Bar of Ethics charges against Mr. Anderson were in early November of 2013. In an unprecedented plea deal, Anderson resigned from the bench, lost his law license, and served a 10-day jail sentence. Yeah, so Michael Morton serves 24 years, and this jack wagon only gets 10 days behind bars. Yeah, not fair, right? So as you may be wondering, Michael and his son Eric have rekindled their relationship. He is now a grandfather and a father-in-law. And he is now and forever an innocent man.
All right, that's it, everyone. That's it for me. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please remember to give a thumbs up if you would like. That really helps me out. Also remember to hit that post notification bell down below so you will be notified of all of my videos in the future. I thank you for watching. And remember, Christine was loved by many, but mourned by all. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.